So I, I want us to look at this whole idea of witnessing to our neighbors around us as not, not, not a knockdown, drag out, uh, bloodied uh, fight, but as building the case for biblical Christianity, following the blueprint found in the Word of God. Uh, it, it is a very exciting and I find a very rewarding, uh, satisfying, certainly challenging thing to do if we are familiar with the blueprint. I had a fellow who was in our church in Tuola, pardon me, boy, I've been a few places, uh, could, have been, could have been Tuola, but this happened to be in Riverton, uh, who God brought along to be there for the building program. The, this guy, uh, contractor, lived in Park City, drove down, helped us with the building program several times each week. And uh, along the way, he wanted to know if there's something he could do for us. I said, well, our, our old deck is, is kind of falling off the back of our house. So he showed up one day with a load of lumber, and his son came along with him, did not have a blueprint anywhere, and just knocked it out. Now, I can't do that. Uh, may, maybe you can witness without a blueprint. I, I can't do that. I, I need, I find that I really need to be instructed biblically on how to do these things. And that, that way, uh, it's not something that I'm going to have to say, man, I'm a total failure. No. No, what's going to happen is if we present the word of God, that becomes the issue, and they can either accept it or reject it. We've done our job, and we've been faithful. If we uh, stay with the blueprint. Now, I want to talk to you now and the Lord willing, one more time about something I'm calling doctrinal evangelism. That was the one we concluded with about a month ago. Doctrinal evangelism. What I mean by that is simply this. From Titus chapter 1 and verse number 9. Holding fast the faithful word, as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to Convince the gainsayers. Gainsayers are people who are anti-logos. They're people who are in opposition to the word, but also have something in the place of the word of God. And so how do you, how do you approach people like that? They have a totally different mindset about what even constitutes scriptural authority. Well, what you do is you minister doctrinally. I really believe that this is a pressing need of our time and our place to do that and to do it as literally, consistently, compassionately, and as accurately as possible. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, the, the whole business here then becomes presenting positive alternatives to error. And the positive alternatives are the doctrinal truths or the, the teachings of the Bible itself. This has been the bread and butter of my ministry for about 150 years now. I can't pick on Bob. I have to pick on myself now, right? So uh, Bob's a guy I always picked on when I talked about old people. But uh, it, I, I've been doing this for, for a while. and I find out the closer I stick to the word of God, the better things are. So we present the positive alternatives that the Bible has to the errors of people round about us. We want to actually examine six foundational doctrines of historical, biblical Christianity. Now, here they are. These are the things that the Bible teaches in six specific areas how to discover truth. What does the Bible say about that? This is even one step before what is the truth. How would a person go about discovering it? The Bible addresses that. And what does the Bible teach about itself? How can we make a biblical case that the Bible and the Bible alone is the word of God? Do you understand how important that is for people around here? If we were able to unload that one successfully, 
And then, what does the Bible teach about God? These are the three that I want us to talk about today. These three. By the way, I usually take at least one session on each of these. But, uh, hey, listen, I'm being compassionate toward you. I'm not going to put you through that, that, kind of, that kind of torture. Well, we're, we're going to move a little faster than that. Now, the other three that we'll get to, the Lord willing, later on is what the Bible teaches about us, about man, what the Bible teaches about Christ, and then you wrap that all together into what the Bible teaches about salvation. Now, if you want more information about any of these, then we're going to be able to share in a brief kind of a summary sampling of these things. Uh, there are more complete notes available to you that I would be glad to, uh, to email. A couple of you have already requested that, and uh, I sent them to you. And so I don't know why you're here today. You, you've, you already know what I'm going to say. But uh, you're gluttons for punishment, I guess. You, you came back to hear it anyway. So, so here we go, the Lord willing. Uh, we will cover these three things together today. And I'm not going to try to be comprehensive. It'll give you an idea of the direction we can go in, in this uh, pursuit of doctrinal evangelism. First of all, the biblical uh, view of how to discover truth. Uh, first of all, I would say expect error. I, I start there. Well, uh, people often assume that whatever they have been taught Whatever their parents have taught them is true. Uh, whatever grandma and grandpa believed is true. Whatever great grandpa and great grandma believed certainly must be true. And you get be, uh, before that, and you might be talking about people who walked across the country pulling a handcart. And how could they be wrong? This is called legacy. This is called heritage. This is called, I can't even conceive that the, those people could possibly be wrong. That's a powerful thing. In, in our area, we know what that heritage is. In other parts of the world, it goes back many more centuries in a different direction. And people can't imagine that the whole culture into which they had been born and raised could be wrong. How could it be wrong? After all, all of this is a production of our religious heritage, whatever that happens to be in whatever part of the world you are. And if you've traveled, you understand that religious heritage produces some very spectacular and comforting, reassuring things for the millions of people who are enslaved by whatever religious culture that happens to be. But what does the Bible say about the likelihood of any of that being true? Well, the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's what we can expect as time goes on. Uh, Statistically speaking, what is, what is the chance that you would just happen to be born surrounded by truth? When you, when you couple this with other biblical passages like, few there be that find the truth. You see that we're not just guessing at this. It's unlikely that people have been taught the truth from day one. Some of you have had that, that privilege. I'm one who had that privilege being raised in a Christian home. Some of you here said, no, that, that's not the way I was raised. Uh, I uh, made, you, you don't even want to know my life before I was saved. I was a mess. I was a piece of work. Yeah, most people are. Another thing here to consider as we talk about how to discover the truth. Don't just assume that the people around you have taught you the truth. That's not a good way to discover. Neither should we look to human leadership. Uh, can't do that. Human leadership 
is untrustworthy. Now, most people will grant that about everybody else's leadership. But here's the problem. Thus saith the Lord, cursed be the man that trusts in man and makes flesh his arm. Now, certainly we can't trust ourselves, but we can't trust that other self next to us either. We, we, we can be wrong. I can be wrong. Now, don't tell my wife that I ever said that. But I, I can be wrong. I remember I was once, I think. We, we, we can be wrong. Preachers can be wrong. Great, uh, exalted leaders of religious systems can be wrong. We cannot assume that because somebody has a title, whatever that title happens to be in whatever specific religion it is, we cannot assume that because they hold that position, they can't be wrong. Now, truth is based not on subjective things like our experiences, people that we know, things that we feel, but truth is, is based on objective facts. Uh, prove all things, Scripture says. Hold fast that which is good. I'm not saying that we base our faith on a pile of rubble in the Middle East that we call archaeology. That's not what I'm saying. I'll tell you what's under the microscope. It's the Bible. That's what's in view. But it so happens that if we're dealing with historical events that some document, the Bible for instance, refers to, if, if it purports to be relating history, if it's true, you would expect probably eventually to find evidence of those truths. It was my privilege a couple of years ago to go to Israel, to go to Turkey. Guess what? The Bible's spot on. It's historically verifiable. But I don't base my faith on the archaeology of it. But we must not go by feelings, our experiences. We, we have to have objective truth. And for us, we're going to see that there's a reason to believe that the Bible is that objective instrument. Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? If we were trying to find the most unreliable way of discovering truth anywhere in the universe, according to this verse, it would be to go to the subjective feelings of the heart. Now here's the tricky part about this. Many answers to prayer, so-called, fall in that category. People say, well, uh, here's, a, here's a book. I want, I want you to read it and pray about it. And, and I believe if you... Read this book and pray about it. You will get a certain feeling that is true. You get, you get this feel, feeling uh, deep inside you that is true. That way you'll know that it's true. Really? No. According to the Bible, you can't trust your feelings. Your heart is unreliable. And the Christian heart is just as unreliable. The only way that our hearts can be uh, less than totally unreliable is if they are totally embedded with the truth of God's word, the Bible. You know, my wife gave birth to four beautiful old babies. And those babies grew up. One only made it to the age of eight. But the others grew up, got older, and then they, then they turned into totally different creatures called teenagers. I don't believe they are the same kids that my wife birthed. They turned into something totally different. 
still love them, of course. But they're different. So you reach a certain age, and these teenagers discover that, that maybe that other gender is not so ugly after all. There, there, there turns out to be some, some kind of an attraction there, right? And so the heart starts beating and fluttering at certain times. And great feelings uh, are generated from deep within toward this person over there. Well, if the Christian young person starts feeling that way toward an unbeliever, that's called forbidden territory to the biblical Christian, right? Right? But I love them. I, I, I prayed, and I think God would have, have me try to evangelize this person by marrying them. Oh. See, our feelings, even though they're strong, even almost compelling, we cannot rely upon these things because they can lead us astray. So, we've been talking about the Bible. How is it that we can make a case for the Bible? Well, wouldn't it be nice if somebody like Jesus had predicted that the revelation of all truth would be complete by, let's say, A.D. 100? That would kind of settle things, you would think, right? You know, there are a lot of people on the earth that had different volumes of scripture. Compared to some that I have seen, my, my library is rather modest. But in my uh, pre-computer library, which actually has real books on real shelves, oh, I, I got some computer stuff too. I got, I, got, I got some of that stuff. I enjoy that. The opportunity to tap into now thousands of resources that are not on my shelves. But I'm on my modest library shelf in my modest little office. I have basically a, a whole shelf of somebody else's so-called scriptures. Uh, how, how are we to know which, if any of them, could be true? Somebody, obviously, in some cases, over a billion people would believe that certain of, the, of these books are the word of God. And that they've been willing to die for the cause over the years. That they really believe. Well, this will help us to sort things out. Because Jesus actually, really did predict that the revelation of all truth would be complete by A.D. 100. You say, really? I, I, didn't, I didn't know that there was a verse like that. Let me uh, share with you what I think is one of the gold standard verses to use in this area in discussing this particular issue with our neighbors. Jesus was speaking to the original apostles, actually 11 of the 12 specifically in John 16, 13, because by this point, Judas Iscariot had just gotten up, walked out into the dark night to betray Jesus. So we, we know that Jesus was talking to specific men. We know their names. We know their, their, their location. And we know the time frame. And to these people, Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you. And he could have named every one of those 11 men by name at that point. The spirit of truth will guide you men, specifically, into all truth. Aren't you glad Jesus said something like that to those guys in that location? So if, if words have any meaning at all, we can look at this timeline and draw some conclusions. Well, there was everything that happened before Christ came. The Old Testament events. Jesus appears, has his, his ministry. 
And among other things in his ministry, he met with those men at that time and, and proclaimed the things that we just read from John chapter 16 and verse 13. And so after Jesus is crucified, he, he is raised from the dead, uh, he ascends into heaven. The, the apostles fan out in obedience to the words of Christ to evangelize. And in the course of their lifetime, they must have been led into all the truth because Jesus said it would happen. Now, that doesn't mean that any one of them uh, walking down a dusty path in Judea one day saw something falling from the sky and all of a sudden, kaplop, into the dust comes a full leather-bound Schofield reference Bible, for instance. And, and here's the little puff of dust that, that goes up into the air and Peter said, well, there it is. He, he said, what happened? There it is. I'm not sure what language this is, but uh, there it is. No, we're, not, we're not saying that. None of those guys ever saw a King James Bible. But all truth was revealed in their lifetime. And if, again, if language has any meaning, before the last of those men died, Corporately, before that group passed on, all truth had to be revealed. That's powerful. And the truth that Jesus referred to had to be the Bible, that hemisphere, that time frame. That's the volume of scripture that was completed during their lifetime in their part of the world. It couldn't be anything else. What does 1830 have to do with it? Nothing. No additional truth was revealed in 1830 or since or any time from the time of the apostles onward. Not a word. God speaks to us today in his word. Amen? Amen. The Bible. Amen? Amen? This is where God speaks to us. I've gotten even more emphatic about that over the last few years. And furthermore, God has pledged to preserve his word. There are those who might grant, well, yeah, well, when God gave his word, that was a very special thing. But, you know, over the years, it has been mistranslated. It has been copied in in incorrectly many plain and precious parts have been taken away as a matter of fact so that we cannot even be absolutely sure that any part of it is reliable anymore there are people who have said almost precisely those words and you live next to them and so do I so what are we to say about the preservation of the word of God? Well, we, I tell you, the best thing for us to say about it is what God has said about it. And we are born again, according to the Apostle Peter, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. By the word of God which lives and abides or literally remains. Peter literally said it is remaining forever. So it was completed during the lifetime of the original apostles and it has been absolutely preserved. In the great body of textual evidence, it is all there. Do not let yourself fall into the overly simplistic argument 
that people have not made some changes over the years, particularly before Gutenberg came along. Some of it may have been intentional. More than likely, most of it wasn't intentional. The changes happened because it's a hard job to copy all of that. In some cases, scribes made marginal notes. They were trying to make their own little reference Bible. And some of those notes got imported, apparently, into the text in some of the copies. Those things really did happen. We are foolish to deny that that happened. That, that, that's historical. But we're also foolish if we go and say we can never know what the truth really is. Good scholarship is very helpful in this regard to look at those texts, evaluate the value of those ancient copies. And it's usually not that difficult to see where things did somehow creep in. Sort it out and get back to the pure word of God because God has promised to preserve his word. You know, I like to say things when yeah, I know that I can get in my car and in 45 minutes, go away. So I'll say this. If you don't like what I said, you can call me on a phone. I don't see anywhere that the Bible, anywhere, anywhere, predicts that God would preserve his word in one set of texts. I just don't see that. If you can find a few Bible verses that say that, I want, I want to see Bible verses that say that. Then I'll change my mind. I've been known to do that. I think I did that once or twice in the past, too. I kid a lot. Come on, guys. Okay. Now, additions to the Bible are prohibited. Say, I know. I know Revelation chapter 22. Many of our neighbors know Revelation chapter 22 also, and they have four ways of explaining it away. It doesn't mean it's inappropriate to use the passage in Revelation chapter 22, but uh, there may be some other, other things that we can say that might be as effective and maybe a little less expected in our conversations with people may be effective. So, we've already seen, this is a package, you see. We had to try to connect the dots. We've already seen that Jesus predicted that all truth would be revealed during the lifetime of the original 12. And that that truth would be preserved. So, once it can be once it can be demonstrated that the Bible and the Bible alone is the divinely preserved, exclusive word of God, then any prohibition found anywhere in the book that tells us we cannot add to God's words, it works. For instance, this one in Proverbs. I love this passage. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Okay, there are other passages, but this is a, this is a summary and a sampling today. Let's move on. We have one more doctrine to cover in just a few minutes. We've seen how to discover truth, which is, on the one hand, no subjective feelings can be relied upon in discovery of the truth. We have to be looking instead uh, to something objective. That objective thing is the Word of God, the Bible. And we've seen how we can how we can be assured of that and share that with others. Now, when you open this book, 
this book, the Bible, God's Word. It is God's Word. It's the Word of God. Well, what kind of God are we talking about? The Grinks, they minister among people, some of whom uh, have some really weird ideas about God and gods, right? A few years ago, they brought a couple of those pastors with them back to the United States. Pastor Mosanga, I'll, 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 never, I'll never forget Pastor Mosanga. He stood on our platform in, 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 in Riverton talking about his past sacrificing chickens to some to some God and then talking about his conversion how God saved him and from the depths of his heart just proclaiming on that spot we should have put an X on the platform over there as holy ground Pastor Mosanka said but God is God Profound. But what God are we talking about? The God of the Bible. You don't have to be sacrificing chickens to a weird river God or something like that to have an unacceptable concept of God. A, A false idea of God, a false definition of God is a false God, just as surely. Just a figment of somebody's imagination. That kind of a God does not even exist. There is only one true God. There are people who believe in the existence of many gods. No, there's only one true God. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. God didn't come from anywhere. And people cannot become gods There will be no more gods because there's only one God. Isaiah 43.10. What a great verse. But this one true God is a tri-unity. The Great Commission. Go ye therefore, Jesus said, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular, in the name of, of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Three in one, one in three. Theologians invented the word Trinity. So you didn't have to stop and have a four-hour discussion every time you talk about the God of the Bible. This is the one that the Bible presents. Let's just call this God the Trinitarian God. The one true God of the Bible, this triune God, is infinite spirit. Not a body of flesh and bones. He's infinite spirit. Not confined to some corporal body. God is a spirit. Actually, the original language is more emphatic than that. God is by very nature spirit. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In other words, worship him for who and what he is. Not try to redefine him in some way. God is eternal. God is eternal. If you were to ask somebody, how long do you think God will be God? Most people get that right. Although I read a uh, a book from a professor at a university you might have heard of in Provo who postulated that if God ever sinned, he would cease to be God. And he wasn't being absurd in assuming that that could never happen. Not at all. 
Whoa. Well, anyway. But most, most people won't have a problem with that idea. How long will God be God? Forever. Well, according to the word of God, that's how long he already has been. Uh, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. That's our God. That's the God of the Bible. I'm glad while well, we're riding the, uh, the railroad in Alaska on our 50th wedding anniversary, I could take this picture out, out the, out the uh, vintage railroad car and get a nice picture to illustrate the point. Before those mountains were brought forth, God was God and always will be. Our God is a lot of things. He has a lot of, so many attributes. They're all infinite. For instance, he's sovereign. Well, of course he's sovereign. If he's not sovereign, that means somebody else is in charge. How do you like that as a possibility? Who would you like to be in charge other than God? How would you like to run things for a day or two? No, our God, only God is sovereign. There can only be one God because of the concept of sovereignty. You can't have two sovereigns. He is totally sovereign over everything and every one of us. He doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand. Listen. This world and what happens ultimately in it or even day by day in it is not the result of free agency. It can't be if God truly is sovereign. Can't be. We call him Lord for a reason. And he is holy. You know, he's even more than holy. He is holy. 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 And the whole earth is full of the glory of this thrice holy God. The substitute so-called gods of the religions of this world are wimps. And worse than that, they don't exist. Now, in part, we have painted a picture today of the true God of the Bible. I have read appalling, horrific statements from the pens of religious authors <coughs> who claim that the God of this world was a man, that he died and had to be resurrected before then progressing on into Godhood. Well, if he died, that means that he sinned. My God is holy. Eternally holy. We have the opportunity, my friends, of taking these doctrinal truths, these brilliant diamonds of truth, and distributing, distributing them to those who are in spiritual paupery. Doctrinal evangelism. See why I'm so excited about it? I have nothing to offer you folks. I have nothing to offer. But the word of God is our sufficiency. If we will share his word with others, then they too, as God works in their heart, 
can understand the reality of what Peter wrote, they too can be born again by the word of God, which lives and abides forever and is sharper than two any two-edged sword. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Father, for giving me the strength to share these these truths with my friends. And I pray that we will now assume the responsibility that is ours and obediently and eagerly, lovingly, joyfully proclaim this great, great word that you have given us to to those around about us. We're not living in neighborhoods just because we happen to choose a certain house. You have put us in our neighborhoods. You have sovereignly surrounded us with specific people. And we see them as our opportunities in days ahead to share these truths. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.